Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Mega Projects. This one, and I know I feel like I say this a lot, but this could be one of the most important Mega Projects. Maybe not in terms of like construction, but definitely in terms of, you know, global impact and political impact, historical impact, this sort of thing. It is the Manhattan Project. You know that, you already clicked on a video titled The Manhattan Project. So let's just jump in. Throughout history, humans have struggled to face their own mortality. The knowledge that our lives are fleeting remains deeply uncomfortable to many. We just try not to think about it too much. But we have always coexisted alongside events that have had the power to wipe out great swaths of humanity. Floods, volcanoes, hurricanes, droughts, the list goes on. Indeed, right now, recording this in 2020, maybe pandemics. But in the 1940s, a project was completed that effectively handed the power of global destruction to its most advanced species, dolphins. <laughs> Not really, that's us humans. We usually think of mega projects as improving the world and pushing the human race forward. Your view on the Manhattan Project will likely depend on several factors, and while we shouldn't glorify the destructive power it ultimately unleashed, it does remain one of humanity's most significant projects. In 1938, two German chemists, Otto Hahn and Fritz Straussmann, made a discovery that would change the course of human history. Nuclear fission, the nuclear reactive process of splitting atoms to create vast amounts of energy, proved that the atomic bomb was theoretically possible. Apart from the obvious dangers of creating something so destructive, Germany in 1938 wasn't exactly where much of the world wanted such a device to be created. Just a year before the invasion of Poland and Czechoslovakia, the Nazi party had already got a stranglehold on Germany. Fearing such power combined with such ideologies, Hungarian-born physicists Leo Szilard and Eugene Wigner drafted the einstein szilard letter in August 1939, urging the United States and its president Franklin D. Roosevelt to accelerate research into such weaponry. If you're wondering about the name of the letter, that's because it was co-signed by a certain Albert Einstein, whom I'm sure we can agree, knew a thing or two about science. Now, progress was slow at first. The US, of course, remained officially neutral until the attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. In fact, during this time, it was the British and their Maud Committee which sprinted ahead. This isn't surprising considering that by this time, Britain had been battered by two years of war and looked to be Hitler's next target. And so, if anybody needed a super weapon, it was the British. Whether it was pride or even slight ignorance of the situation, the American physicists lagged behind in the early stages, and it wasn't until findings from the Maud Committee were shared with their allies that the Americans began to take things seriously. At some point, everyone realized Nazis having nukes is a bad idea. On the 9th of October 1941, President Roosevelt approved the atomic program and placed the army in charge of running it, primarily because it had experience in large construction projects. But this was so much more than just a military operation. Researchers from around the country now focused their attentions on this nuclear project. A team at the University of California began investigating electromagnetic separation, while a group at Columbia University focused focused on gaseous diffusion, and yet another group at the Carnegie Institute of Washington focused on thermal diffusion. What had begun slowly was now gathering pace. All right, so the Manhattan Project officially came into being on the 13th of August 1942. Its central offices were based in Manhattan big surprise there, at 270 Broadway. Its title comes from the practice of naming corps of engineers after the city they were created in. The atomic bomb project was therefore known as the Manhattan Engineer District, MED, or Manhattan Project for short. While the project had received a steady yet modest stream of funding, it was here that it received its first significant sum of $500 million from President Roosevelt. And that's $500 million in 1940s money. Numerous sites throughout North America took part in the Manhattan Project, with two in Canada and dozens in the United States. The most famous of these, whose name has become synonymous with the entire project, was Los Alamos. Under the direction of Robert Oppenheimer, who would go on to carry perhaps the unfortunate title of father of the nuclear bomb, 
In fact, I made a video all about Robert Oppenheimer on, <laughs> on another channel I do called Biographics, and I'm fairly sure that's the title we gave him. Anyway, this laboratory at Los Alamos undertook most of the remaining research, as well as the construction of the actual bombs. The enrichment process was done somewhere else completely, and we're just about to come to that. By D-Day, on the 6th of June 1944, the Manhattan Project employed some 129,000 workers, 84,500 of them being construction workers, 40,500 plant operators, and 1,800 military personnel. But considering the numbers used, only a tiny fraction really knew the full extent of what was being done. Time magazine famously stated after the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki that no more than a few dozen people in the entire country knew about the full extent of the Manhattan Project and described many as moles working in the dark. Seems smart. You've got 129,000 people who could potentially leak that America's working on a weapon that could destroy a city. You know, that's not going to be good. Okay, so I'm not even going to try and explain the full complexities of what went on within the Manhattan Project. It's pretty insane and complicated. There were 129,000 people working on it. But let's get a quick overview. And do remember that a lot of this is happening at once, just in lots of different places. There were two elements unstable enough to be used for a nuclear bomb, uranium and plutonium. Uranium had been first discovered in 1789, and during the war, it was thought to mainly be found in four places. Colorado, northern Canada, Wachimstal in Czechoslovakia, and the Belgian Congo. Only one of these, Wachimstal, was currently under the control of the Axis powers. The British and Americans saw it in their best interest to gather as much as possible both for their own weapons, but also to stop the Nazis getting it. The Shinklobwe mine in the Congo had the richest concentration of uranium anywhere in the world, but was also flooded and closed. But enough money was dangled in front of the Belgian government to reopen the mine, with the British and American governments purchasing 1,560 tonnes of ore at $1.45 a pound. Oh, and if you don't know anything about Belgium's involvement in the Congo, let me just say that it was as bad as colonial rule could be, and I dread to imagine the conditions in that mine. So this raw uranium it needed to be turned into uranium metal. This sounds like something that should be easy enough to do, but it totally isn't. Several early and less than successful attempts proved just that. It wasn't until 1943 that the Ames process was being used, which essentially placed uranium tetrafluoride and powdered magnesium in an iron pipe and heated it to 1,500 degrees Celsius or 2,730 degrees Fahrenheit. This produced a small amount of uranium metal. By 1943, this section of the project was producing 45 kilograms, that's 100 pounds, of uranium metal per week. Then there was the process of separating the isotopes found in uranium. The element is comprised of 99.3% uranium-238 and 0.7% of uranium-235. But only the second part could be used for a nuclear bomb. Oh my, you could see why they needed 129,000 people. <laughs> it's complicated. This too was astonishingly difficult to do. The laboratory at Oak Ridge, where the uranium enrichment took place, used three separate techniques. Electromagnetic separation, gaseous diffusion, and thermal diffusion technologies to get to the right point. In 1944, a few hundred grams of enriched uranium made its way to Los Alamos. By July the following year, 50 kilograms, 110 pounds, had been sent, most of which went into the first bomb, known as Little Boy. Okay, so that was one element we mentioned. There was also another one called plutonium, probably heard of that one, which had only been chemically identified in 1941 at the University of California. Again, this also needs to be chemically separated first. The air-cooled X-10 graphite reactor was constructed at Oak Ridge, over 112 acres, while at Hanford, a total of six water-cooled reactors were used. These were named A through F, with B, D, and F being constructed first to maximize the space between the reactors. What emerged from these two processes was two different bombs. The first, Little Boy, you've probably heard of that, used uranium U-235, while the other, Fat Man, was powered by plutonium. The threat of espionage on such an important project was 
pretty high. But it was one of America's allies at the time that posed the biggest threat. It wasn't until the 1950s that full details began to emerge about Soviet spies successfully infiltrating the Manhattan Project. The most famous of these was Klaus Fuchs, a German theoretical physicist working in Los Alamos. German-born, but with British citizenships, Fuchs was able to pass atomic secrets to the Soviet Union, first in Britain and then later in the US. In 1950, he confessed to espionage and served nine years of a 16-year sentence before being deported to Germany. But while the Manhattan Project's primary aim was to design and build a nuclear weapon, it had another key role also, which was to gather information on the German nuclear project which was ongoing. Operations to disrupt German progress ranged from attacking the heavy water plants in occupied Norway to tracking down Iranian shipments and attempting to intercept them. Okay, so as D-Day approached, it was thought that the Germans might use a radioactive weapon in response to the landings. Operation Peppermint sought to prepare the Allied troops for such a possibility. Teams in both Chicago and Cleveland had helped to develop mobile radioactive detectors that could be easily used on the battlefield. A system was put in place for medics to report any suspicious ailments while the Chemical Warfare Service was trained to use Geiger counters. Thankfully, as you definitely know, none of this ever happens, but you know, better safe than sorry. And you figure, well, if we're working on a giant city destroying bomb, entirely possible they are too. So let's be careful. Codenamed Trinity, the world's first full scale nuclear test, took place at 5 30 in the morning on July 16, 1945, at a testing facility in Socorro, New Mexico. And when I say a testing facility, I actually totally just mean an abandoned ranch in the desert. The McDonald Ranch House had been begrudgingly vacated in 1942 when the army moved in next door, but it was this ramshackle dwelling where much of the final preparations and assembly of this test bomb occurred. The blast, which occurred 2 miles 3.2 kilometers from the McDonald Ranch had the power of 20 kilotons of TNT, leaving a crater 76 meters 250 feet wide of radioactive glass known as Trinitite. The explosion was felt over 100 miles, that's 160 kilometers away, with the mushroom cloud reaching 7.5 miles 12.1 kilometers in height. Can you imagine seeing so that having never seen destruction or explosions on that scale? <laughs> Just seeing something rise 12 kilometers into the sky. It must be terrifying. Unsurprisingly, a cover story was quickly created and fed to the media about an ammunition magazine explosion at Alamogordo Field, but Trinity had been a success. This is like the biggest store of ammunition ever. Okay, so there are two quotes often associated with Robert Oppenheimer from this experiment, which have come to represent both the beauty and chaos that arrived in the world that day. However, neither come from him, nor did he ever claim they did. They are, in fact, from the Hindu holy book, the Bhagavad Gita. The first was, a thousand suns were to burst at once into the sky, that would be like the splendor of the mighty one. The second one, the one you probably know, is now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. The debate around the events of the 6th and 9th of August 1945 has raged since those very dates. Some argued that the first nuclear attacks the world had ever seen were justified because it sped up the end of the conflict that had so far claimed between 70 and 85 million lives. Others claim it was unnecessary and was done purely as a cynical way to test their newfound weapon. Those in either of these extremes are missing the massive gray area in between. I mean, yes, it did speed up the end to a terrible war, and it no doubt saved lives in the long run, but it also remains one of the most terrible acts ever committed by humanity. It's easy for us to look back at these events 75 years later with a slightly patronizing sense of right and wrong, but the decision that faced the American administration was both win-win and lose-lose. They knew they had the power to end the war, but they also knew it was going to come at a terrible cost. In May 1945, the Interim Committee was formed to discuss the use of nuclear energy, both during the war and after. This panel studied the effects of such an attack from a human level to a political one. At the Potsdam Conference, which began on July 17, 1945, to administrate a now-surrendered Germany, President Truman informed Stalin that the United States was now in possession of a significant superweapon. He didn't go into any further details, but as we know, Soviet spies had infiltrated the project, so Stalin 
Lennon certainly already knew. <laughs> Gotta be pretty terrifying news that arriving on your desk. It's like, they have a, a city destroying bomb, sir. So. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> on the 6th of August 1945, a Boeing B 29 Superfortress named Enola Gay, after the pilot's mother, took off from Northfield on a small atoll in the Pacific. Inside its hold lay a device that would make history known as Little Boy. Hiroshima was chosen because it was the headquarters of the 2nd General Army and 5th Division. The bomb detonated 530 meters, 1,750 feet, in the air, and it had a blast estimated to be the equivalent of 13 kilotons of TNT. The world's first nuclear attack flattened an area roughly 4.7 square miles, that's 12 square kilometers, and destroyed 69% of Hiroshima's buildings. 30% of the city's population just died immediately, around 70 to 80,000 people. Five years later, studies estimated between 200 and 240,000 died either directly or indirectly as cancer levels and problems during pregnancy soared. Three days later, once again, a B-29 took off with a terrifying cargo. This time, it was Fat Man. Perhaps the most horrific aspect of the attack on Nagasaki was that it wasn't even the primary target. I'm not sure I'd agree with that, actually. I think the most horrific part of it was the fact that, you know, it killed tens of thousands of people. Military planners had chosen Kokora, 75 miles, 120 kilometers northeast of Nagasaki, but heavy cloud cover meant that after three runs over the city, the pilots diverted to the secondary target, Nagasaki. Fat Man detonated above the city's industrial center and destroyed around 44% of the city. The fact that it had been confined to the Urakami Valley meant that the hills protected much of the city. But still, between 35 and 40,000 people died that day. According to history, that was where it ended. But it so easily could have been different. A third bomb was being readied to be used around the 19th of August, with three more planned in September and two in October. These hadn't been created yet, but Los Alamos was under the assumption that they would be needing them and they were working towards them. The day after the bombing of Nagasaki, President Truman gave an order that no further nuclear attacks would be carried out without his express consent, and they were never needed. Japan was now a country in a destructive freefall, and it surrendered on the 2nd of December 1945. It's pretty incredible that they thought they might need extra bombs just in case completely flattening two cities was, and the Soviets joining the war, of course, wasn't enough of a push for Japan to surrender. By the 1st of October 1945, costs on the Manhattan Project had reached 1.845 billion US dollars, which is 22 billion dollars today. Yes, that is an extraordinary amount, but compare it to the cost of the war. That was just nine days of war spending. So it suddenly doesn't sound so big. That number had reached roughly $2.4 billion, $28 billion today, by the time the United States Atomic Energy Commission, the AEC, took control of the project on the 31st of December 1946, ending the Manhattan Project. Around 90% of the total money had gone to the construction of manufacturing plants and the production of fissionable materials, with just 10% going into the design and actual production of the weapons. From 1947, the AEC was a civilian-run program, though the government, of course, kept their own little side hustle. The Manhattan Project will be forever remembered for those two days in the skies above Japan. Nothing like it had occurred before, or since for that matter. War has a habit of bringing the very best and the very worst out of humans. The tragedy handed out to a predominantly civilian population in Hiroshima and Nagasaki remains a marker for mass destruction and death that we should all strive to never go anywhere near again. It may be a little redundant to search for positives in something like this, but they can and they should be found. The ability to separate isotopes in such quantities led to a revolution in nuclear medicine, with much of it being used for the diagnosis and treatment of cancer. The technology also led to the use of nuclear energy around the world. This is often another area where people see either black or white. It's either terrible or far overused and unsupervised. The truth is that nuclear energy used in the right way is an awesome power that could lead to unimaginable advances. We're just still not entirely sure how best to use it. This is a fact that makes those years in the first half of the 1940s all the more astonishing. But perhaps the most important thing to come out of the Manhattan Project was simply that it gave belief to science. I know it was science used in a terrible way, but even terrible advances have a habit 
of pushing us humans forward. Just 16 years after the end of World War II, a human being was in space, and 24 years later, we walked on the moon. From the wreckage of the largest conflict in human history came a burst of progress. And the Manhattan Project was very much a part of that, whether we like it or not. So this has been Mega Projects. That was the Manhattan Project. This was a big one requested in the comments, I believe. So thank you to everyone who pushed it forward and upvoted it to the top. If you have suggestions for a Mega Projects video in the future, please do post them in the comments below. Also, go along and click that little thumbs up to the ones you like. And if you don't like it, I guess you can click the thumbs down as well. And while you're doing that, click the thumbs up on this video. Subscribe if you haven't subscribed. And I'll see you next time.